but neat. I thought it would be interesting um, to begin the interview exploring how you got into the business and what was your experience with Stan because almost all people who have worked from him have taken away valuable life's lessons in their experience working there. And I don't, even in my own interactions with him, if I've had maybe the sum of 30 minutes of interaction with him, 10 of those 30 minutes are the most memorable that I've had in financial markets for the things that he has said that were interesting or informative and for his ability to cut through things pretty quickly and come to sharp observations that are almost undeniable. Even with respect to parenting, one of the slogans he uses is with parenting, uh, quantity is quality. And that's the most simple summary of parenting I've ever heard and the most accurate. So you studied undergrad, both biochem and um, um, economics, right? Yep. And was that by design to move into a fund management type position or did you want to keep an option open to go into biochemistry or some type of medical field? Thank you for having me, Christian. I, um, you know, I don't come from a family of investors. Um, I was born and raised in India. My dad's an engineer and I thought I would be an engineer. And uh, I went to University of Pennsylvania for my undergraduate degree. And the only reason I went there is because they allowed me to do a joint degree program between the engineering school and finance. And I love the engineering bit so much that I stuck around to do a master's in engineering. And all my summer jobs were in engineering. Uh, when I needed the money, I went to go program. When I didn't need the money, I programmed. And that was uh, what got me excited. Um, I was gravitated always towards the math and the science and the technology bit. The thing about the University of Pennsylvania, if you go to Wharton, is it's an incredibly gravitating force on the campus. And it almost doesn't matter what else you do. If you did Wharton, you somehow ended up in finance yep. after college. So I ended up at Morgan Stanley here in New York yep. in banking. Uh, and if I could choose a sector, which I was able to, I chose to focus on technology. So what, how much time frame did it take you from uh, entering as an undergrad to graduate with a master's degree? Four years. Four years. So uh, you're coming out of university as though same age to your peers, but with a master's degree also. Yeah, I did two undergrads and a master's in that four years. And still what got me excited in the morning was technology. And I went into banking. I stayed there for about a year and uh, started interviewing for other jobs. Banking, I think gets a, uh, an unnecessarily bad reputation. That year that I worked there, you know, it was really my first job. It was the first time I got to learn how to uh, be an employee, uh, pay attention to detail, uh, do the job you're asked to. And at some point you start wondering if there's more you can do. And through a headhunter, um, I got an interview with Duquesne. And I still remember to this day getting that phone call. The recruiter calls me and says, Benit, you'll never believe this. Uh, Duquesne Capital is looking for a technology analyst. And there was sort of an awkward silence because I was expected to uh, know what Duquesne was. And to my embarrassment, I had no idea. And she says, I'll say it again, Stan Druckenmiller wants to hire a technology analyst. Uh, she finally says, I'm going to hang up the phone. I want you to uh, go to the computer and do a little bit of research, call me back, and at least act excited. I, I went through the interview process, and um, during the entire interview process, up to and including the interview, the final interview with Stan, and for the next six years, I felt like I got really lucky. But I still remember getting that job and uh, looking around, and it... I mean, you, you nailed it with Stan. The guy is a legend. But even the 20 other people that worked there were some of the best people I've ever worked with. And there was so much to learn. Uh, technology was back then a small enough sector where I could do a lot. The people I directly reported to allowed me to do a lot. And it ended up being just the, the most incredible experience. I started there. In 05, um, I was 23 years old. And in a few years, I was made a portfolio manager. Uh, I was the young, one of the youngest managing directors in the history of Duquesne. Started managing a portfolio, which grew over time. Um, what size did that start? Uh, it started at, at either 100 or $150 million and slowly grew uh, over the next 
three or four years. And that, that whole time working with Stan, I mean, you, you, you're, you're spot on. You would have uh, tiny little interactions with him. Uh, sometimes they were direct, sometimes they were indirect. You would overhear him say something. And those five or 10 or 15 words he spoke would stay with you. They would be stuck in your head for the next day, the next week, the next month. And you look back at the summation of all the things he said, and they start forming, uh, if you're into investment management, a set of risk philosophies. If you're interested in how to lead a more an ethical life, which I think um, in the investment management business, he, he, he's among the best, uh, it, it, it has an enormous influence on you. Um, particularly if you're, if you're young and particularly if you are lucky enough, like I was, to be in such close proximity to him. There, so there was a famous moment where at Tudor, they do every year a fire, or they had in the past done every year a fireside chat where Paul Jones would bring one of his peers on board and interview the person. And Tudor's philosophy has always been steadfastly that, tr that portfolio managers should have stops. You know, what's your target price out? And what would be the target price where at which you're gonna have to be invalidated and, and know you're wrong and dump it. And so Paul had Stan come in for one of these, gets him up on stage, the entire partnership of Tudor are there. And he says, where do you, how do you think about stops? And Stan said, I don't. If I change my mind, I sell it. And it would have been as though somebody said to the audience, God doesn't exist. You know, it was a shocking moment for the people who worked there. In your experience working at Duquesne, how did you, what did you take on board about risk management and how you know, did that influence your process now? It's amazing. The, the way I, we run Techni uh, is very different than Duquesne. Duquesne was a macro fund, one of the greatest macro funds in history. Uh, and Duquesne did everything under the sun. Stocks, bonds, currencies, rates, commodities, we do only stocks, and within stocks, we only do tech. Um, Duquesne was sometimes directional in nature. We are, uh, uh, if anything, uh, uh, more concentrated. We own 10 companies. We own them for long periods of time. We don't really- What's your average holding period? Uh, it tends to be measured in years, yeah. about three years. Uh, as an example, uh, during the month of March, we had hardly any trades. And I believe March in 2020 was one of the most volatile months in 25 or maybe 50 years. Duquesne uh, was very different. And this isn't a, a good or bad thing because that track record is, is uh, nothing but the best, but it was very different. Yet, the way we have structured Techni and the way we invest comes out of that, what I thought was the single most important lesson from Stan. And that lesson was uh, you make 80% of your returns in a given year from a handful of things. So what are you doing with everything else? Yeah. Um, pick a few things and bet big. And that's exactly what we decided to do. You know, the, the, there is no merit in your 16th best ideas. It's like Occam's razor philosophy to investing almost. And, and, the, and the second big thing I learned from him was uh, focus on the big things. And if you get the big things right, the little things won't really matter. And we th talk about this a lot. I think about this a lot. You know, you're often wondering, am I sized correctly in this position? Should it be an 8% position or a nine or 10% position? And to me, those have become the small things, the little things. The big thing is, should I be in this position or not? Should I own this company? Should I be short the stock? And that's the big thing, you get that right. Everything else will matter a whole lot less. You know, when, when a stock goes against you, you can't be small enough. 8%, 10%, 12%, all of those are the wrong answers. And when a stock works, you can't be big enough. And so, those two big ideas, which is focus on a few things and get the big thing right, the big picture, uh, the, the yes or no question right, and over the long term, everything else will become much less important. And what were the two minutes at Duquesne when there's a minute when you'll have decided, okay, I'm sticking with this career track, I'm going to be a fund manager, I enjoy what I'm doing, and that's it for my career. And then the second one is when did you decide, okay, now having made that decision, Duquesne has been amazing. I'm going to set out on my own and put out a shingle that says Benit at Techni doing my thing. It's really funny and, and you know, people only have the experience they've lived. Um, I don't think I ever had a moment where I decided this was it. I had about a dozen moments where I wondered if 
this was it. Mm. Uh, where I wondered if it was more likely that this wasn't it. Uh, you know, when you get a, uh, there's no day you wake up knowing you got a stock right, but there are many days you wake up knowing that you might've gotten a stock wrong. And when you get enough stocks wrong in a short period of time, you start wondering, you know, maybe I should have stuck with engineering. And, and the next thing you know, five, six, seven years go by and you realize that um, you're probably not as bad as you thought and you're probably not as good as you think. You're somewhere in the middle, but you really like it. And there's a ton of room for improvement. And you looked at everybody around you. I was unfortunately, or, or maybe luckily, one of the younger people there. And so there was a ton of experience walking around you. And all of those people still came to work learning hundreds of more things. And the, the other thing I got lucky with is I, I chose tech, or tech chose me, that's what I, was excited about, and it's hard to be a tech investor and, you know, in my opinion, ever get bored because there's always something new. So I think enough time goes by and you realize you're not as bad as you were on your worst days and you realize you can get better and you decide I'm going to keep going. Um, you know, I think a lot of good careers are made when you just pick a thing and stick with it for as long as, as possible and 2020 will be year 15 of doing this, and uh, I might as well keep going because I like it. The, the second question of when did you decide to leave, you know, even those, these, these narratives are never as clean uh, as, as, they, uh, as, they, as you might want them to be in your own head. I was approached um, by a, a, a wealthy family um, to manage money for them. And uh, again, there was never a day when I knew it was the right thing. There were many days when I wondered if it was the wrong thing. And the best advice I got during that period was also from Stan, where, where he said some version of, look, I was 29 years old when I started Techni in 2012, and he was about the same age. Uh, to be clear, no way am I comparing myself to, to him or anybody else. But he said for about the first five years, I wondered... Um, uh, if this was really for me. And I think part of what she was saying is you, 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 never, you never feel ready. It's never the perfect time. Your partners are never the, uh, the permanent partners, but you, you, you do it, you take the risk. Um, in a way, it's like investing where you, you get uh, trained at making decisions based on imperfect information. And the decision to stick with investing, the decision to join Techni, the decision to leave and start Techni, uh, excuse me, Duquesne, Th those are all decisions where there were more days you wondered if you had done the right thing, but you, you do it and you sort of course correct and next thing you know, 15 years have gone by. What's been the evolution of your investment process since you've left? So if you were studying under a master chef and you were the sous chef and you learned a lot from Stan, and in time you open your own restaurant and it becomes Benit's place, what has been the evolution of your process since you left Duquesne to this point now and how would you describe what you do now as a process? We have become, over the last eight or nine years, um, much more concentrated. You know, we used to own maybe 20, 25 companies. And you know, the typical fund will own 50 or 60. So we were above the median. Um, we were top quartile concentration. We've taken that uh, to the next level. We're at about 10 companies today. Um, we were always long-term investors, never really focused on the day-to-day -day or week-to-week -week or month-to-month, -month, we're now measuring ourselves in years. And I think that has uh, even a longer runway to go. The other big transition that's happened to us, and this is maybe peculiar to technology, is we have effectively decided that out of all the things you need to do to uh, make money on an investment, you can only choose a few of them. And for us, it was going to be paramount uh, business quality and uh, focus less and less on all the other things. Because it's, it's back to that big lesson from, from my first job at Duquesne, which is get the big thing right. And we decided in technology investing, and this might be true for other industries, the big thing is, is this a good business? Is this business sustainable? And are the profits expected to grow? All the other things, if you get that right, end up mattering a lot less. Said differently, you get that wrong, and nothing else will really save you. 
so th those have been probably the biggest changes. And then if I, if I look at my own process for be, doing headhunting, um, one of the approaches that I use is to kind of spin counterclockwise. And that will either catch people off guard or enable me into situations where I wouldn't normally belong. Um, and also it enables me to do things that I think are outside of my own capabilities. What, um, if your personal fingerprint on, on Techni, what, how do you see that? As opposed to the process, which is a more rigid thing, what's the part of it that's uh, something that is part of your personality you've kind of embedded into the organization and into its thoughts process? You realize that, um, and I think this is something um, you're very good at, and I've seen uh, uh, you experience this, kind of confirms my perspective, which is you realize that even investing, which is a very numbers-focused uh, uh, game, really comes down to relationships. And uh, you start realizing that the network you've got uh, is really important because that network when you've got a question, points you in the right direction. The network doesn't give you the answer, but the people within that network will tell you which way you're heading. And if you're heading the wrong way, they'll tell you to turn around. And so I think if you had to ask the people I work with at Techni, what is it about their process that's changed or evolved due to uh, my, my fingerprints, it would be to uh, maybe step outside of the Excel every once in a while and lift your head up and ask people in your network questions. And you know, when people say network, uh, in their mind, they think I, 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 must, I need to ask uh, CEOs or founders or hedge fund managers or billionaires. You just need to talk to a lot of people. And that was something that I think Duquesne was really good at. Um, and I saw all these people that were, over time, they became experts. But you know, they didn't go to school for this, they didn't have a necessarily a particular knack for an industry. They developed a network. They got good at asking questions. They got really good at knowing people's biases. I mean, I think this is another thing I've sort of watched you and other people get very, very good at. The same question and the same answer could have different consequences based on who's asking and who's answering. And it's like that old uh, lawyer uh, advice that you're given in law school, which is you never ask a question you don't know the answer to. One of my favorite sayings, by the way. And my version or the investment management version of that would be you never ask a question without baselining that person's answer. Mm. And so this bit, I think, is just as challenging as modeling a company or trying to forecast the future. But uh, just like those other two things, it requires a lot of practice and experience and you get good at it. And um, but But that's something that I think is a very, very important part of how Techni invests. And what's in, in the history, since you started Techni, what's your, the investment that worked well and taught you a lot in the course of its success, and what's one that kicked you in the teeth, but if you can give specific names, that kicked you in the teeth that you thought, you know what, I'm not making that mistake of going down that hill again without the brakes on. Our investment process has, has evolved, and uh, the requirements that we've got of the kinds of companies we'll buy or the kinds of stocks we'll buy is- And what are those for, for example, the yeah. filters? So today, uh, we'll only buy businesses that are growing, businesses that are profitable and unlevered. And our perspective is if you own a portfolio, so we own about 10 companies, of businesses that grow, make money, and there's no debt ahead of you as a stockholder, as an equity holder. And those 10 companies you own are uncorrelated to each other. Whether uh, due to geography, they're in China, Brazil, and the US, or due to sectors, one software, maybe another is a semiconductor company. If you put together 10 uncorrelated businesses that grow, they make money, and there's no debt ahead of you, the odds that you'll take a permanent capital loss on that portfolio over three years is, you never want to say zero, but it's exceptionally low. And all of those requirements, the requirements of diversification on, and on low correlation, profitability, growth, lack of leverage, they've all come from mistakes. And there was a point maybe five or 10 years ago when we would have bought a company if the stock was cheap enough. Uh, and you asked about a mistake and, and the handful of times we've done that, maybe in aggregate uh, we made some money, but it hasn't really been worth it because what, you know, again, it's about knowing yourself what I realize, if you pitch me a stock that's cheap enough, 
I think subconsciously what's going on in your head is your bar for quality is going down. Mm. Because you're sort of saying, gosh, how much money can I really lose here? Or I don't need to worry so much about the quality of the business, the quality of the CEO, because the valuation is so low. And you end up tripping up. You end up making a mistake and time goes by and you realize that you should have just cared about the business a lot more than the price. If you invert that, if you pitch me a stock that's very expensive, and let's say the chart looks straight up and to the right, which, like, uh, uh, which is the case today for a lot of technology companies, now your uh, internal radar is set very high. Your bar is very high. And you're thinking to yourself, gosh, this thing is trading at some uh, insane short-term valuation numbers. The chart looks like this. This better be the best business in the world. This better be the best CEO or the best set of managers or the market better be the best. And ironically, that's a good place to be. It's a good place as a starting point to have a bar set high than set low. Now, uh, we have made enough mistakes setting the bar low that we decided we're not going to try to modulate. We're just not going to do it. Uh, we're only going to buy businesses where you would buy them if they were 50% higher. And so I think the, the, the single biggest change that's occurred is, is, is uh, subconsciously putting yourself in a position such that you're not going to allow for uh, mediocrity to, to, to come through just because it was cheap enough. Um, and what's your, this, uh, this is one of my favorite answers, but what's your f uh, philosophy on diversification? So, Speaking I, of don't ask questions, you don't know the answer. Yeah, uh, you know, it's generally a bad idea. Uh, now I think, you know, Warren Buffett, one of the greatest investors of all time, says you should own index funds. Well, he doesn't own index funds. And part of that answer is if you know what you're doing, um, uh, you should not diversify. If you uh, aren't managing your money professionally, um, then, then maybe you should diversify. So the, the, it depends on who's asking is the, is the answer. But I think, um, you know, my old boss Dan used to say, you're better off putting all your eggs in one basket and watching that basket really closely. In other words, I think you want to get to a place where the number of decisions you're making is few, not many. Yep. And a basket with three or four or five eggs in it uh, is fewer decisions to make than uh, a basket with 100 eggs. You still, um, still got to get things right, but I would rather have the pressure of monitoring five or 10 companies than 50 or 100. And in the history of the fund, you've had one down year, right? Or uh, we've had two down years. Two down years. Yeah. Yeah. What was the psychological impact of that? Like how did that, you know, losing a fight, how did that leave you in terms of the comeback match and other things? And does it influence your investing psychology? It does. The first down year, the, the first big down year was 2014, uh, two years after we launched the fund in 12. Um, the second down year was 2018. And they were both very different. Um, the first down year we had in 2014, we were at about 25 or 30 stocks. And uh, exactly to your question, uh, the one prior, when things go against you and you've got to look after 25 or 50 eggs, you sort of don't know where to start. You know you probably should be buying. Um, you're waiting on a few people to call you back to kind of go through your process. But what's not waiting for you is the stock market. Mm. And things move too quickly. That down year uh, left an indelible impression on me that I, I, I never want to be caught in that position. Not in the position of a down year. You can't control that. But in a position where I got to look after too many things, uh, uh, you know, it's like that classic analogy. It's like trying to change tires in a moving car. 2018 happened, uh, which was our, our, our second big down year. We were down in the teens. Uh, and... All of it happened in the last 100 days of the year, 90, in the last fourth quarter. And 100% of those losses were unrealized. So there was not one share of one company that we sold. 
and we bounced back enormously the following year, and that's continued to this year. In other words, not every down year is a bad year. It, it really depends on how you react to it, and a, a reaction, the, the wrong reaction to the first down year has influenced um, a reaction to the second one. And how many employees do you have? So we are a very small firm. We're about uh, six people in total. Half of us on the research side, the other half on the business side. And how do you manage the, you know, to do this is sort of like mixed martial arts. You have to be able to do some business management and then you have to be a portfolio manager. How do you balance those two things on the, the fulcrum there? So I, I decided that the easiest way to do this is to be as transparent as possible. Um, and to put yourself in a position such that um, by the time there's an issue that needs to be discussed or a decision that needs to be made, at the least, the facts are known internally. Um, and you know, the easy way that everybody else uh, talks about is, well, you hire the right people. And uh, people would tell you it's easier said than done. I've done a tear, but by the way, it was very easy to hire good people at Goldman. Right. Because you're sort of using the house's money. And if you don't like them, there's a whole process in HR to move them on. Right. For myself, I've found it terribly difficult to select the right people and then to get rid of them because the personal loyalty grows to a point where you're like, they jumped in this crazy thing with me. How do I get them out now that they're not working? Yeah. It's very, it's much more difficult than doing it as a third party or an agent on behalf of another organization. It's, it's difficult in almost every case. You know, generally people are, are slow to hire. Uh, quick to hire and slow to fire. And so, you know, my management style, our management style is to be as transparent as possible. So almost every person at the company is a partner. Um, we send out our, our, our uh, performance of the funds and more or less the business every day to everyone mm -hmm. internally. And one of the things that I've seen happen at a lot of other companies is, is the big, uh, anxiety-inducing year-end bonus process. It's, uh, first of all, in many cases, you don't even know when it'll happen. You don't even know if it's a month of December or January or February. Uh, you know it's sometime between Thanksgiving and spring. When it begins, you don't know if it'll be a, a minute long or, or a, uh, an hour long. Um, and, and worse, when you're given the number, you've got a real tough decision to make if it's a little bit off. And in almost everyone's case, it's, it's a little bit off the wrong way, which is you've got to decide if this is worth fighting. And, and I think that whole process was something um, I wanted to avoid a technique. And so our, our year-end processes with, with, with our employees, with my partners, um, uh, will never be a one-day, one-event thing. So it's not as if uh, we're going to sit down on Monday at 3 o'clock and at 4 o'clock is my next one. It will begin on Monday. We'll start at 3 o'clock. We'll go an hour, and there are going to be more questions and answers. We'll pause, come back the next week. We'll pause, and we'll keep doing it. In one case, uh, it went on for months. And uh, I, I think allowing uh, transparency, allowing people to deliberate, it goes a long way. Um, you're still gonna probably end up at a point where people maybe feel like, um, you know, they, uh, they weren't compensated fairly, but at the least, uh, that process is gonna be given as much air as possible. And how would you describe 2020 and the complexion of your portfolio this year? Um, w what a wild year. Um, you know, we, we, we were in China in January, the middle of January. And we, uh, knowing what we knew now, we probably wouldn't have made that trip. We got out of China just in the nick of time, about two or three days before the country went into a lockdown. Uh, and we kept traveling. We went to Brazil, we went to Mexico, we went to Europe a couple of times until about March when we couldn't travel anymore. Pre-COVID, our funds were doing quite well. Um, we're up double digits. The month of March, uh, was a wild month. I described earlier how we uh, didn't trade at all in the month of March. And that's not to say that it's because we fell asleep. If anything, it was the opposite, which is we never slept. But 
What allowed us to stick with it on, let's say, March 23rd, the market low, was not because we knew it was the market low or because we were doing well. We didn't know it was the market low. We were very scared and we were not doing as well as we were a month ago. What allowed us to stick with it is we own businesses that were growing, profitable, and unlevered. And back in March, this idea that uh, tech had been a winner has not become at all clear, but there were starting to be signs. And uh, you know, we, in the middle of March, would have considered ourselves lucky if we could got to our February p and um, We got to a February p and in about a month and we're through it now. Uh, I, I think as far as technology goes, you know, we're living in 2023 or something. Mm. In other words, the future has been pulled forward. Yeah. And what people maybe uh, don't appreciate is that if this is 2023, and in many parts of the economy it is 2023, it's not as if the world ends. There's 2024 and 25 and 26, so we're going to keep going. Um, I think entering this year, technology had a target on its back, at least here politically in the U.S. And, you know, it's become the savior. Um, and so I, I, think, I think you were in a golden age for technology. I think that age has uh, blossomed. Yep. And I, I'm sort of hoping that over the next three, four, five years, technology doesn't become a sector, but a way that businesses operate because I think that's what we're living through. I think there are too many people who are trying to time technology. I, I gotta get in or I missed it or I gotta get out. And I think it's a myopic way to think about technology. Technology to me is not a six year trend or a 10 year trend. This isn't 1999. Uh, this is gonna uh, permanently change almost every facet of how businesses are run and operate. And what's, um, what's your favorite investment right now? Like, what's the one you really would want to, you know, if you're trying to sell me to make an investment at Charles Schwab, what am I supposed to do? Uh, or even in a private That's the thing. one thing I'm um, probably not supposed to do. Here's what I would yeah. say. I think one of the best places to be uh, as an investor today is China. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, China, I think, um, has some incredible advantages many of which are known, some of which have not made their way through the markets. One of the, the hottest sectors to be in, in, in today and, and over the last few years has been software. Um, people have sort of had their eyes open to, to, to software. And what people really like about it is if you've got a good software company like Microsoft or, or Adobe or even a lot of the smaller ones, you realize that you don't really have a whole lot of costs. And there is no better business than a business without a whole lot of cost. The only cost a software company really has are the engineers. And software engineering salaries today uh, for a good software programmer are as high as, as what network engineers made 10, 20, 30 years ago, which was measured in seven figures, not six figures. I think this is where China uh, is about to break out. Um, and I'll give you two stocks, one of which you've already seen it, the other one I think you're going to see it in, Zoom. Zoom at its core is a telecoms company. They allow for people to communicate to each other over the telecoms network. Uh, what makes them so amazing and special is not just the quality of the product, but the fact that a lot of their engineering and therefore their costs are in China. Mm -hmm. So they sell the same product as, let's say Cisco does or anybody else, except they've got different costs. Well, there's another company that's recently gone public called Agora. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, they're capitalizing on two trends. The first one is what they allow for two people or, or many people to talk to each other uh, over a telecoms network, except their telecoms network, unlike AT&T's, is virtual. And the cost of telecom goes down over time. Their other cost is software engineers, and they've got uh, that base in China, not in Silicon Valley. And so I think they're going to beat any of their Western competitors because they've got telecom costs, which are universal for everyone, and they go down. And the second cost they've got are, are people, and, and, and you've got really talented people uh, for, for incredibly uh, 
uh, attractive commercial rates in China than you do in Silicon Valley. And the product they're selling, which is the enablement of people talking to each other, whether it's audio or voice or video, um, there's a phenomenon in China called live streaming, where if you think back to the old days of, of uh, 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 people selling goods here in the US on, on TV, you know, that's now gone to the internet. And so I think live streaming, live broadcasting is huge. And if you can find a software business where the costs are in China instead of the U.S., I think you've got a winner on your hands, as Zoom has shown. Um, and what's one question that you would have anticipated or wanted to answer today that I did not ask that you'd like to throw for yourself and take a swing at? You know, you've done uh, a thorough and an impressive job. You know, the, the, the question that we probably get most often, we touched on it, is, is um, you know, is it over? Hmm. Um, whether it's, it's in the equity markets or, or whether it's about technology. And I, I, think, I think that question or that way of thinking it, um, really is, is just missing the point. Mm. You know, I think uh, technology as a sector, as a way of, of, of doing business and all of that is, is not a five or 10 year trend. I think this is here and probably here for 50, 60, 70 years. You look back over the last 100, 200, 300 years, and when major innovations happened, they didn't, it wasn't six years and you never heard about them again. They went on for decades. And I think, I think we are, uh, whether pre-COVID or post-COVID, uh, we are sitting inside of a multi-decade uh, uh, period of, of technology innovation, and it's global. Benid, thank you. Thanks for having me. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here on Real Vision.